Welcome back to the DoD Risk Management Framework Series. In this section, we're going to take a look at some of the cybersecurity policies, regulations, and the overall framework itself. The goal is to be able to describe the evolution and interaction of security laws, policies, and regulations in information security, list the DoD cybersecurity policy drivers, access the correct documents for cybersecurity guidance, and describe assessment and authorization transformation goals. For those of you studying for the ISC squared cap exam, this section will identify the relationship between the risk management framework and the system development life cycle. However, remember, you need to study the contents of the essential documents listed in the tables of this chapter. So every great story has a beginning. How did these policies come to be? Well, they started very independently. Uh, the Department of Defense had their set of guidance, and the federal agencies had their sets of guidance. For the Department of Defense back in the 1970s, and for both the Defense Department and federal agencies by the time the 1980s rolled around. It started with the 5200 series. Uh, some of you more seasoned veterans will remember the Rainbow Series, a series of books all color-coded uh, to tell us exactly how to do specific items. On the federal side, we dealt with the OMB Circular A130. As time progressed, the DOD's cybersecurity initiatives became more complex and needed more direction. Approximately this same time, right there in 1997-96 or so, we have the introduction of the Klinger-Cohen Act. Remember, anything that ends with an act means that it's a law, that means that it came out of Congress. Fast forward to 2002 and Congress introduces FISMA, the Federal Information Security Management Act. On the other side, we have the DOD and they finally introduce a standard control set within the accreditation process. 2004, we see the introduction of the NIST 837 and 2005, 2006, the 853 and the accompanying FIPS 200. Now, on the DOD side, we have the DOD 8510. This was the original introduction of DICAP. An updated and better process than DITSCAP, but still not quite perfect. However, looking at the two documents side by side, the 853 series and the 8500.02, which was the control set document for DICAP, there is striking similarities. We'll get into a little more of that later. So, remember I told you that FISMA, it's, it's a law, and all federal systems now, including the Department of Defense, must report back to OMB at the end of each calendar year, no later than December 31st. So who is OMB and what do they do? Well, some of the main functions of OMB include maintaining the government budget, federal finance management, and data collection. Now, when it comes to NIST, the Computer Security Division has several documents that you must be familiar with, starting with, of course, the FISMA Implementation Project, then the Standards for Categorizing, that is FIPS 199, the Standards for Minimum Security Requirements, FIPS uh, 200, Guidance for Selecting Security Controls, which would be Special Publication 53, and guidance for assessing those controls would be 853A, assessing A, <laughs> kind of tricky, right? Uh, the guidance for security authorization, uh, the original 837, and how to set up your continuous monitoring, 800-137. So what are the policy drivers that got us to this point? Well, one of the most important drivers is the integration with the other federal agencies. Networks have grown up and 
out. They're no longer self-contained little boxes. At some point in time, every system is going to connect to another within the federal government. Also, increased network growth and globalization, increased threat sophistication, and increased speed and connectivity. All of these are integral drivers as to why the entire federal system had to get on one standard set of guidance. Now, you'll notice here that I crossed out compliance. Why? The risk management framework is not about compliance. It's not a series of checklists. It's it's designed to be what is best for the system. It's not like DICAP. We're going to get into this in a little more detail, but you'll notice that I will keep crossing out the word compliance and just in your mind, insert the word security posture. Understand what we're looking for is efficiency for real security enforcement, not just a documentation drill. So what is the individual benefit to the individual stakeholders? Well, the CIO, for instance, standardizes the IA language across the entire federal government. Finally, we're all talking the same language, whereas the warfighters, they can get more rapid development of solutions that they need to go fight the fight. For business system owners, you find more consistent and assured protection of individual privacy and data support supporting the DOD business systems themselves, and for system developers, an increased coordination and integration of security into the system's development and acquisition process. At the end of the day, it's all about efficiency. Everything you see here is efficiency driven. Now, I know that it does take a long time and we're gonna walk through the timeline on how to start with RMF package from start to finish, but you only have to do it once. Once that system has been properly categorized, once the controls are selected, the overlays are worked, you're done. All you have to do at that point is maintain. So some of our transformation goals as we move into the framework are to define a common set of trust levels and to adopt and apply them using the CNSSI 1253 across all intelligence communities, DODs, and other federal agencies. To adopt reciprocity. No need to continuously reauthorize systems just because they're moving from the Air Force to the Marine Corps to the Army and maybe to the Department of Energy. Next is to define, document, and adapt common security controls. This is done using the NIST Special Publications 853 as the baseline. Adopt a common lexicon. Get us all talking the same language so we can approach the mountain of cybersecurity issues all speaking the same language. To institute a senior risk executive function. Now, it's important to understand that this is a function. It takes the whole family. It takes intelligence. It takes your classic six element, whether it's G6 or N6 or S6. It's going to take the two and the three and the four and the eight, the whole family, everyone that has a security function must be an integral stakeholder in the risk management framework. And next, to enable a common process, consistency. The easiest, strongest systems are ones that are predictable. With a predictable baseline, you have a predictable outcome. Being able to manage the system throughout its entire life cycle is paramount. So the Director of National Intelligence approach to policy and standards was to establish the ICD-503, and they will continue to develop the intelligence community standards as appropriate for those required systems. However, they will be leveraging the existing NIST special publications, bringing the intelligence community more in line with FISMA and it assigns the Inspector General audits which are based on the NIST standards. 
consistency and align with the rest of the federal government to support overall reciprocity. Remember, the optimum goal here is to ensure that all key policies for the intelligence community are either in an official CNSS publication or in a NIST special publication. So as we continue to move and now talk about the implementation goals, here is the desired outcome. First, moving away from what we called max or mission assurance category levels. We don't address these systems as Mac one or Mac two or Mac three anymore. We also will not be referring to them with classification levels like classified, sensitive or public. We move to addressing them with impact levels such as low, moderate and high and security objectives to meet the confidentiality, integrity and availability. This ensures the DOD is synchronized with the rest of the federal systems using the NIST standards. Next, reciprocity. Inside the DoD I 851001. Next, the DoD will use the NIST 853 Security Control Catalog with DoD specific assignment values, implementation guidance, and valuation processes. Remember, the goal here is to ensure that the DoD Security Catalog categorization and control processes are in sync with the NIST standards. Next, continue to incorporate new IT structure and other new risk management framework terms into the CNSI 4009 and continue its use as the official glossary of terms throughout the 8500 series. Next on the list is to continue the DoD enterprise governance structure and strengthen the interfaces to the intelligence community enterprise governance. This is implemented through the DoDI 8500.01 and 8510.01. Next, to continue the co-evolution of security control categorization and selection, the risk management framework, a component of the gig integration architecture alignment framework for gig IA and other supporting elements of the gig technical framework and gig IA portfolio. And lastly, to incorporate transformation concepts into DOD policies that adopt new concepts via enterprise governance and promulgate via knowledge service, as well as continue to influence the gig IA portfolio for configuration management, automated monitoring, and other enablers. Next, let's take a look at how the risk management framework integrates with the system development lifecycle you'll see that there is a specific step to do at every piece of the classic system development life cycle. So let's walk through the steps one by one. First, initiation. Next, development and acquisition. Third, implementation. Fourth, operation maintenance. And fifth, disposal. Now let's take a look at which step of the risk management framework fits with which step of the system development life cycle. Initiation, step one. Development and acquisition, step one, step two, step three, step four, and step six. Implementation, step three, four, and five. Operation and maintenance, step six, and disposal, step six. There is an action for security to take in every step of the system development life cycle. This is where we get the bumper sticker baked in, not bolted on. So how has the process changed? Well, let's take a look. So from DICAF, the old 8510, to risk management framework, the new 8510, really there's just a change in language. There's a lot of similarity here. We used to address systems as MAC and confidentiality level, and now simply 
impact level and sensitivity objectives. We used to have some rigid information system definitions. Those definitions have been expanded to align better with the CNSI 4009. The DOD had their own defined set of security controls. Now we have a universal set of security controls across all federal systems. We used to have the CNA process or certification and accreditation. Now we have the ANA process, assess and authorize. So, paying close attention to the proper guidance documents, where we had the 851001, 8500.01 and 02, the DICAP instruction, the CNSSI 1253 has been condensed to the 8510 itself, which will point you to the 853 series and the CNSS 1253. For the intelligence community, we use principally the DCID 53, as well as the DOD instruction 8502 for the controls, the protection levels implemented within the CNSS 1253 documents. That has now been condensed to the ICD 503 and the revised CNSS 1253. For all other government agencies where we were using the common controls, the ISO standards, the NIST 837, the CNSS 1253, the NITSI and the NIAP has been greatly reduced, has been greatly reduced to simply the NIST special publication 837, 30, 39, 53, 53A and 137. Here is a complete list of what would be considered critical guidance. You have the FIPS series 199 and FIPS 200, the special publication series, the CNSS, and the OMB circular. Now, the only thing really to watch out for is for DOD systems, instead of using the FIPS 200, we simply use the CNSS 1253 for the baseline controls. All other federal systems will continue to use the FIPS 199 and FIPS 200. As part of this transition, the DoD has taken the opportunity to continue to align its information management and IT policies, including cybersecurity policies, into the 8000 series under the sole responsibility of the DoD Chief Information Officer. Here you see the Base 8000 capstone, the 8100, where you will find the new 8140 that replaced the 8570, the 8200 for missional and functional processes, the 8300 for information infrastructure design, the 8400 for information technology, and the 8500 for cybersecurity. Now, the only really tricky one is that the DoD has published under the 8100 series the cybersecurity policy as part of the 8500 series. When I went and took a look at why would they do that, well, 81 is more general. It applies to everyone, whereas the 8500 series was very specific to IA or cybersecurity people. This will help better align for proper education, training, and awareness across the environments. In our next chapter, we're going to take a look at some of the RMF roles and responsibilities. <laughs> Wild, wild west. <laughs>